Hello to all and welcome back to War Thunder Aviation. But before I get into this episode of Should You Get, I just wanted to say something really quickly. You see, over the last couple of weeks, I have been on holiday, so of course I haven't made any videos. But while I was on holiday, I noticed that I hit 1,000 views on my channel, which is a pretty big thing, and I'm really happy about. So I just want to say thank you all so much, and also thank you to all my subscribers. I've got, you know, I've I've got loads of subscribers over the last couple of weeks, and it makes me uh, very happy to see so many people enjoy my content and, well, want to see more. But anyway, onto the should you get for what is the greatest aircraft in the world, also known as the Spitfire Mark IX. Now, it goes without saying that this is the most iconic aircraft of the Second World War, if not of all time, which is a pretty big thing if you think about it. But how did the Spitfire reach this level of fame, I hear you ask? Well, quite simply, its story went something like this. In 1931, the Air Ministry specified they wanted a new type of fighter, capable of 250 miles an hour. RJ Mitchells jumped at this idea and designed the 224 open cockpit monoplane. However, only one of these aircraft was ever designed, as during its first flight in February 1934, it was decided that the Gloucester Gladiator biplane was accepted into service rather than 224. This was a big disappointment to Mitchell and he decided to do a series of clean-up designs by adding retractable undercarriage and reducing the wingspan. This was known as the Type 300 design and was submitted to the Air Ministry, but once again was never accepted. At this point in time, most people would just give up. The design was clearly something that the Air Ministry wasn't interested by, and at this point in time, most people would just clean the drawing board, start anew, and make a completely different design. But not Mitchell. He was committed, and at this point, he went through even more changes to the Type 300, including the incorporation of a fared, enclosed cockpit, oxygen breathing apparatus, smaller and thinner wings, and the newly developed, more powerful Rolls-Royce V12 engine, known as the PV-12. Which is an engine that you'll probably better know under its later name of Merlin. So all the pieces are starting to fall into place, and all of the little aspects of the Spitfire are starting to come together and create the aircraft we know today. But the Spitfire wasn't done yet, as on the 1st of December 1934, the Air Ministry showed interest and provide £10,000, which was of course a lot more back in the day, for the continued construction of the improved 300 design. And in April 1935, the armament was changed from two 303s to four, finalising the design for, on the 5th of March 1936, its first flight. During its first flight, it was concluded that the Spitfire was indeed a very good aircraft, with some minor issues, and once these issues were addressed, on June of the very same year, the Air Ministry placed an order for 310 Spitfires. However, due to various complications in the actual building of the Spitfires, it wasn't until mid-1938 that the first Spitfires rolled off the assembly line. But how did the Spitfire gain its legendary status, I hear you ask? And, well, the main reason is due to the Battle of Britain, which, despite the fact that it was vastly outnumbered by its Hurricane counterpart, which did objectively do more towards the overall victory of the Battle of Britain, it still had a better kill-to-death ratio, and, not to mention, had a lot more favourable flight performance. It was because of this that both civilians and pilots alike came to love this aircraft, and it actually became one of the main figures of the British in the Second World War, giving a lot of inspiration to the British forces that maybe this war is actually winnable, which is a great morale boost considering only a couple of weeks ago was the legendary failure that was the Battle of Dunkirk. It was from this point on that the Spitfire became the RAF's go-to solution, and because of this, the Spitfire played in many roles, from interceptor 
to reconnaissance, to even a fighter bomber, it's played in just about every role you can imagine. Not to mention, the Spitfire was the only British fighter to see continuous production throughout the war. But it goes without saying that they weren't just doing the same design throughout the entire war, and over time the design was changed and improved. By the Mark II Spitfire, the Merlin engine had been upgraded, and although the 2A variant still had 8 Browning machine guns, by the 2B variant it was armed with cannons, which of course greatly improved its combat effectiveness. The next large improvement to the Spitfire was during the late 1940s, where the RAF predicted that the Axis would start using high altitude bombing, so they had to make an aircraft that was capable of high altitude interception. Cue the Spitfire Mark V. The Mark V had a pressurized cabin, which allowed for high altitude flying. However, the Mark VI had an even better pressurized cabin, which allowed for even higher flying still. And the final Spitfire I'll talk about tonight is the Mark IX, with the supercharged Merlin 61 engine. This was considered a quantum leap over that of the Mark V, and the Spitfire Mark IX it was said to be outstandingly better than the Spitfire Mark V, especially in heights over 20,000 foot. Not only that, but it was said to have a lot better climb rate than the Mark V, and was still very manoeuvrable even at altitudes as high as 30,000 foot. And there you have it, the complete history of the Spitfire up to the Mark IX. But now we ask the real question, which is, how good is it in War Thunder? Because you may have forgotten, but this is actually a War Thunder review, and well, yeah, it, I'm sorry, I didn't expect it to take seven minutes to do the entire history, but oh well, we had fun, didn't we? So, the Spitfire Mark IX, a rank 3 battle rating 4.0 aircraft that, if you ask me, is, well, pretty well balanced for its regular opposition it faces. Uh, with two 20mm Hispano Mark II cannons, with 120 rounds each, you'll find that you won't often run out of ammo with them unless you're really spraying them. Which was a really good thing though, uh, they've now doubled the ammunition for the Mark IX, because the biggest problems with the fives was that you only get 60 cannon rounds each, and you'd often burn through them fairly quickly. Uh, as for the 7.7mm out of 4 point of battle rating, they're pretty irrelevant, but, you know, maybe they'll be just enough to bring down an enemy fighter or something, if you get lucky. As for the climb rate of the Mark IX, it's actually uh, pretty good. Uh, it's a lot better than the fives and before, which, as we know by history, uh, is correct. And, as for its turn time, it's, well, it's a Spitfire. Like, what do you expect? It's gonna be one of the best turn fighters in the game. That is unless you come up against a zero or something, but let's be perfectly honest with you. When you are basically one giant glider slash paper aeroplane, of course you're going to have the best turn time of them all. The only real problem with the Spitfire is the fact that it's not actually as fast as a lot of aircraft you'll come up against. Things like Fucker Wolves and BF-109s will quite easily fly away from you if given a chance, so always make sure to try and turn fight with enemies if possible. So what's going on in this game? Well, I've already got one kill and one assist, and I'm currently flying uh, behind this P-47, and there's only two enemies left in the game, and I know this. But for some reason this P-47's just sort of flying away. Like, he's not even flying towards his base, he's literally just sort of flying in that direction. And this is getting me really suspicious, I'm thinking, well, why? And then, so I look around, and then there's a P-51 right on my tail. That's a close call, if I would have took another second to wait for him, I would be dead. So, I duck down, go for a bank around, and then go straight into the vertical, bring it around and I go onto the tail of the P-51. But the P-47, who's clearly realized his, his uh, silly little tricks didn't work on me, tries to go for me, so I go for a head-on, then roll off, 
And once again, I was actually going to go back for him, but then I noticed this P-51 is on the Allied Typhoon's tail. And we're not going to have any of that, I don't think. So let's go quickly on his tail here and take him out before the Typhoon gets uh, eliminated here. And line it and shoot and kill. What is it with American wings and always falling off? It's, it's always the way. But either way, the P-47 comes in. My ally almost team kills me, and I headshot the P-47 pilot. Now that is a good game. And there's my pink smoke, because I am extremely manly, and uh, I don't actually know why I chose pink smoke. Why, why wouldn't I? That's the question. And yeah, so, to answer the question of the night, should you get the Spitfire Mark IX? Well, yes, absolutely. An absolute legendary aircraft. Uh, probably one of the most famous aircraft of all time, and well-deserved. And for once, Ganjin has actually made an aircraft in their game realistic. I mean, goddamn. Whew. I know, it's, it's, it's a big day for all of us. I mean, you never know. They might actually start balancing the game soon, but, you know, that's not being too hopeful about that. So anyway, I say thank you very much for watching, and until next time, I say thank you, and I'll see you then.